have to. I'm going to have to practice before all of our podcasts. I'll have to warm up my vocals. La, 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 la. And you can just pop in and out from like that corner and like, <laughs> la, 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 and then you're out. Yes. <laughs> Every time I, hope, gonna be good. I hope Nick takes your little Lebanese, la, 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 then puts it on. Welcome back, everybody. You're here with myself, Dean, Flex Success co host, Lizzie. And our wonderful guest today is Matthew Bartholomew. Hey, Dean. How are we going? Very well. Thanks for jumping on, Matty. Um, Matty's a really cool, uh, I was going to say customer, but he's, I was going to say client. He's also not a client anymore, but he used to be a client of Flex Success. He was mm -hmm. on board for like probably a good Long. 12 months, I think. Yeah, uh, a little, little bit March, longer, but a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting to get Maddie on because Maddie's sort of gone the full circle. He actually followed probably a similar route to myself in regards to his strength training, except I ended up in the aesthetic world. He ended up in the powerlifting world. So you're but vain. We, we, <laughs> both, we both came from um, team-based sports. So far. So, so far. far, yes. <laughs> but we both came from team-based sports and then moved into individual sports. And I thought it'd be interesting to talk to you today, Maddie, about um, like the, the shift the, the mental uh, strengths and differences that you see in team-based sports that you're now applying to your individual sport and also some considerations mm. for natural powerlifting because you are at the top of your game when it comes to that. But I'll, I'll throw it to you. Maddie. who are you? What do you do? And what do you, why do you do it? <laughs> who are you? <laughs> um, so, yeah, guys, if you don't know me, um, I've been in the industry working as a PT and a coach for going on seven years now, so pretty much once I left school. Um, I've worked as a you know, general commercial gym PT for a few years. And then since then, I've split off into coaching athletes. And I've gotten to the point now where I work with 100% uh, powerlifters. And as, it, as uh, Dean mentioned, I've moved from you know, being more in team-based sports like rugby and rowing, moved into you know, training for aesthetics, which is probably one of the more common reasons people train to lose weight or to you know, gain muscle, that, that, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, long term, I've moved into powerlifting. I've been competing in powerlifting for three years. Uh, I get coached by Andrew Tang from Melbourne. Uh, for those of you who know Obsidian Strength, he works closely with the gym there. Um, and yeah, pretty much now I'm looking to you know grow my business as a coach, uh, keep learning, keep expanding my knowledge. Uh, and for a long time there, like Dean mentioned, work with Flex Success, uh, learned heaps about nutrition and definitely uh, excelled in my in my competitive uh nature uh in that time so yeah that's pretty much a roundabout about me i have two questions to follow on from there if you don't mind yeah so you Go mentioned that. that you're a pt and a coach um i started in the industry as a pt for nearly 10 years before i switched to being coach um okay. and i think i have a pretty good idea of the differences but i'd love to hear your opinion on what you think the differences between a pt and a coach is yeah, so the biggest difference for me is I feel much more like a mentor and a guider now. Um, you know, as a PT, I think that the the day to day is very much you know your client clocks in for an hour, clocks off, and then you see them next week. Um, it felt very much like a hand holding scenario, and all of the time it could almost feel more like uh, a catch up, even though you know you're there trying to make sure every rep is on point or you know they're working really really hard. I think there's more of a shared responsibility when you're coaching. Uh, and the coach is putting in the structures, you know, implementing certain guidelines and push, pushing that person in a certain direction. But there is a nicer relationship, in my opinion, when you're coaching, because it isn't uh, a story of, you know, I haven't got results, it's all your fault. It's more of we're both entering into a relationship where there's a you know, very mixed responsibility. Uh, and I think that it's a much nicer place. And I think also, for me personally, it feels like a progression. Um, I think calling myself a coach is off the back of learning more uh, and understanding that the best results are probably um, gotten in that shared scenario rather than it being that case of I'm your PT, here's what you do, yada, 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 here are my orders. Uh, that's how it feels to me anyways. But yeah, it's a good space. Yeah, awesome. For sure. I totally agree with all of that. As a PT, I found that like the, I was handholding for one hour a week. But we yep. know the magic doesn't happen in one hour out of what's 24 times 17? Uh, a lot, a lot. So 100, if you're, 148. <laughs> there you go, 148 hours and you're only with your PT for one. So, so exactly. I love that uh, how you described it as a shared responsibility looking at other aspects because we know that uh, changing body composition or strength or whatever is what we call a wicked problem. There's not only one cause or one factor that we need to cause, but, but multiple making mm. it wicked. Um, 
which has nothing to do with the musical or being evil. <laughs> <laughs> but that's sort of wicked. Do you have anything to add to that, Dean? No, I mean, I've kind of only, I suppose, moved into the coaching space. I, I've really only coached online outside of my university um, practical hours that I was required to do face-to-face -face within a team environment in strength and conditioning, not in nutrition. But I think you pretty much nailed it, dude. Like, I think the one difference there is that when you're a personal trainer, you come into the industry initially, you are kind of like a product protocol following uh, trainer in that you've learned the yep. basics, you've learned the rules, you now implement the rules as they are stated. Um, you only mm. deal with them one-on-one -on -one, and you are training the individual. You're not really coaching them on anything. Too yeah. Much outside yeah, of I, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely agree. And I would extend on that, that when we're talking about online coaching, that really epitomizes the concepts there because you can't touch, talk to in person. You can call them, but you can't really interact in the same way you would with a PT client. There really has to be that upskill, education, use of principles, flexibility, auto regulation, shared responsibility. There must be in that online capacity, or it really doesn't work as we've experienced. You know, I think our relationship has thrived as coach and client when we were working in that capacity because you were teaching me constantly. I was able to understand the directions, but it was always a protocol of, you know, what you were saying goes, but there was an umbrella there that existed. Um, and I think that's, you know, your, your, yours and mine, mine and Tang's relationships are the relationships I model for my clients because I feel they're successful for those reasons. So yeah, I a hundred percent agree with those ideas. Mm. The second question I had to follow on was you mentioned that, you know, you learned a lot about nutrition. Um, as a, as a client of flex and you're able to excel in powerlifting, I wanted to know what sort of were the, your biggest takeaways? Mm. The biggest takeaways, one of the biggest ones, carbs are my friend. <laughs> um, <laughs> All of them. When I, <clears throat> that's right. When I came to flex, I was very fixated on, on definitely gaining body weight because when I started as a powerlifter, you know, there are weight classes for those who don't know. Uh, the weight classes have slightly shifted in my federation, but right now I'm in the under 94 kilo class. In my first competition, I weighed 88. And at that time I was, I was pretty diced for a powerlifter, you know, like for the normal expected body composition of a powerlifter and what would be conducive to good performance. So my, my goal was definitely to grow into that weight class. The way that I did it was pretty much to relatively track protein in the ranges that I knew were, were optimal and then just calorie surplus. And for me, that meant a lot of like high fat shakes and the intake got to a point where I was not having a optimal performance ratio with my macros, which was the biggest thing that I noticed when I shifted over to flex. We went through a process where we really shifted to carbohydrate dominated diet, obviously with high protein as low as possible fat was really the goal. And the ideas there were obviously to be able to get into a calorie surplus and minimize fat gain in that time. And I really saw like robust differences between the surpluses I was implementing and then the surpluses that we went through as a team uh, where I was considerably leaner at higher body weights, like considerably. And that, I noticed that in the first six months. And then from there, it was like, well, this is the norm. Um, but that was the coolest thing for me was that I was really gaining the right weight and I had a lot of carbohydrate availability, which meant that I was training really, really well. And it meant that, it has meant that, I've had this platform to uh, really fuel training phases correctly. And that's the thing we did. We've really changed the way we fuel training phases. And lastly, I really learned how to um, acutely manage weight when I needed to in the most optimal ways, because that would probably be one of the biggest pitfalls of powerlifters who don't have a nutrition coach is that they manage their weight acutely, very, very poorly when it comes to optimizing their performance, which is the goal. Mm. <laughs> um, so those, those would be the biggest things that I've learned. And then, you know, I've been able to pass that on, that knowledge on, whether that be in discussion, whether that be in guidance. My guys won't do some of the silly stuff we've seen powerlifters do to manage weight, if at all. You know, like we've got Steve working with you, Lizzie. We've got a knowledge and an understanding that's, we've talked about this is spreading from the bodybuilding world and it's seeping into the powerlifting world. And I think that's really, really good thing. And we've talked about how it can give back the other way. Um, but we're seeing more discussions. You know, I can think of the guys at JPS in Melbourne. They're really massive advocates of similar concepts and trying to get bodybuilders to understand guys, muscle moves, weight, 
optimize your body composition and also don't be that guy losing five kilos in the last 10 days mm-hmm. you know so yeah, th- those are the big picture things for me yeah that's some pretty awesome takeaways love that yeah, yeah. you mentioned bad, um <laughs> <laughs> we'll slip you a 20 after after the podcast is over good no luck yeah. um <laughs> use my code <laughs> <laughs> I I coach some um I don't coach people for bodybuilding prep but I do coach some performance athletes and it's not yep. just powerlifters uh and bodybuilders that do things poorly I would say mm. in a huge way it would be um martial arts mm. competitors right. they do yes. dumb shit with their diet all year round but even dumber leading into a fight and I don't mean dumb in any sort of judgmental way I just mean in a way that is really counterproductive to their performance um, how they yeah. heal their sleep, like everything. Yep. So uh, we want to teach people better ways so that we can support the end goal, which is better performance. Yeah. And I guess like it's only dumb because it's, it's only happening because of a lack of education. It's mm-hmm. not like they know these two options and they're choosing the silly one. Yeah. It's more of, it's actually culturally ingrained a lot of the time. Yeah. 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 So, you know, like, and I guess sometimes we see, I don't know about martial arts, but I know in like MMA, it's often a 24 hour weigh in period. And so, I think our federation and a lot of federations are moving towards shorter weigh-in periods to try and stop people being as drastic because we're seeing people seriously, you know, implicate their health to try and like make weight for a weight class. That's like 10% under their floating body weight or something. Right. So we're we're seeing this happen and, and yeah, I would totally agree. And I've heard horror stories about, you know, fighting guys or girls trying to make weight and like having a very hard time getting back on a drip or something like that to get back to weight, which is just like, well, well, yeah. you know, UFC currently, I think, are actually at a 36 hour by the time you do Incredible. the Incredible. Oh, so, that's so long. So when, you see, when you see the individual do the weigh in on TV, that's actually just purely for acting. They've weighed them in already and then they refuel them so that they look healthy for right, TV. Right. For those of you that have yeah. no idea about what we mean by that, Dean's saying that you weigh in for your fight three days or 36 hours before you actually get in the ring. So you've got yeah. those three days. Not three days, 36 hours. One and a half days. Three days. One and a half. Oh yeah, there you go. I can count. I'm, I'm good a at that. Day is twelve hours long. Yeah, you know, because <laughs> we're, 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 talk- <laughs> we're talking about basically like individuals that have the opportunity to weigh in in the like say morning or afternoon, I should say, on like a Thursday, but they don't actually compete till Saturday night. Mm. Um, so mm. they are giving mm. them an excessive amounts of time to get that weight back, and, and what that does allow people to do, which is what we didn't have the opportunity to do is to rely on making poor decisions or doing drastic changes because they can then fall back on the fact that you've got a lot of time to fill back up. Mm-hmm. Whereas for yourself, Maddie, you, you worked on a, a two hour way. in so you want to do yep. some silly stuff. You've got two hours to try and eradicate all of the negative uh, uh, adaptations you've achieved. Good luck. And barely even because you've got to warm up too. Mm. That's true. You know, it's barely even like you, like, the worst case for you is let's say you have a two hour weigh in, which is actually the weigh in for national competitions. The local comps are one and a half, two hour weigh ins. Um, let's say you've had a, you've, you've had a bad run of luck and you're the last one to weigh in. Well, that turns into an hour and a half. And then let's say that you miss weight and you've got to weigh in again at the end. Well, now you've got an hour and then you've got to warm up half an hour out from starting. You've got half an hour to refuel and rehydrate. And that's the squat. Yeah. So you can't even really do it. You know, if it was to bend, seen, it would be a bit different, but. I've seen some, some uh, scenarios where someone has dehydrated so hard that they've come out, nearly failed their opener. And we've witnessed the dehydration process occur. They've come out to their second and hit it better than the opener. They've come out to the third and smoked it. And luckily had a great day. Um, but that, that's, we're, we're talking seconds. You know, we're talking, if he had come out 30 seconds earlier to the opener, you would have seen a fail, you know? Mm. Uh, and I just don't fancy that stress. <laughs> <laughs> That's no. cutting it real fine. We've, uh, it's actually, yeah. the, the interesting thing, so we've got like, uh, Maddie, what, what federation are you uh, primarily competing in now? So World Powerlifting is the federation and then Powerlifting Australia is the body I compete in in Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Which is cool, which is a tested federation. And then we yep. also Decided have- regulated. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the cool thing with uh, the pro raw division, which is on at the Arnold's every year in Australia is that it's now a two hour way and it has been ever since they started it. The interesting thing that I've noted with uh, athletes that I've worked with in those divisions or in that particular competition is that the individuals overseas who are smoking weight categories in regards to totals. So like their squat bench data, like in the top echelon, whenever they've traveled to Australia for pro raw to do a two hour way and hit the same weight class, they've all bombed. 
nearly every one of them have nearly bombed. Some of them have got away with it just on just sheer genetic strength. They've got their yeah. one lift and that's made them win or place. But the individuals that are doing these crazy weight cuts don't understand nutrition appropriately throughout the prep. They get here on a two hour weigh-in and they shit the bed. Mm. It's very, very different game. Mm. Yeah. 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 That's unfortunate when people work so hard and they like really put themselves through the ringer and then it falls apart like that. It's yeah. devastating. It's because, and, and you know, and when, when we speak about it, really the concepts are simple um, once you know them, but if you don't know them, maybe they're not, but it's dis disappointing for that reason. The, the, the knowledge is there. The methods are there. It's more so about being sensible and having foresight during, during your season, you know, like it's not really about that last couple of weeks. You can get some stuff done then more smart than other ways. But really, it's about good management. And, and what, what we were doing, you know, Dean, was getting me to a point where I was heavy, but as light as possible, eating the most I could, you know. So we had like all this power and we practiced and we collected data. Like we would practice five day periods of undulating carbohydrates to see just how much I could drop. And we had five, six day periods where I could drop two to three kilos of just glycogen. And that was like insane. And I, I still trained beautifully. Um, mm. You know, and that's a position I'm sure a lot of athletes would love to be in, but instead they're starving themselves and then just turning the tap off on drinking water for like a day and a half. It's like, yeah. uh, <laughs> <what>? <laughs> you can predict the outcome there. Yeah, <laughs> Totally. <laughs> so tell us how you got into powerlifting because you mentioned that rugby and rowing, I think you said were your backgrounds. Yeah. And I'd love to talk more about rugby and rowing soon, but to talk about powerlifting and getting in there, I, um, I'd actually just torn my MCL in my knee playing rugby. Um, it was less of a functional or strength problem. Just some, some prop just landed on my knee. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, that for me, <laughs> that for me was a little bit of a wake up call of like, Hmm, I didn't have a lot of control over that. That sucks. And, um, you know, so then I went through the recovery process, lost 13 centimeters circumference on that left quad during that six uh, wow. three, four months <laughs> and, um, managed to get that back pretty much. I think it was, I think I made a post. It was like 32 weeks or something like that, that it took to kind of really reattain that. And I was, uh, you know, when I trained for footy, uh, rugby union, I was a good rugby player. I wasn't in the, in the elite and I probably wasn't going to make it. It was a hobby more than anything, um, which you know, technically pals in is too, but I'm better at it and I love it more. Um, but when I was training for rugby, I loved my gym training, you know, and arguably a little bit more than I, than I loved rugby to the point that, you know, if I pulled up from a rugby game on the weekend with a cork in the quad or something like that, and I was limping, the, the, the upset would be, oh, I can't squat well in a couple of days, you know? So that was like the mindset. Um, but anyway, the transitions, it was really due to um, a good mate of mine, Luke Ashton, who I worked with for a few years at Macquarie University, really smart guy, really strong guy, um, has like put his hand to many sports. He's super elite athlete. He, um, him and I are really good friends. We're a lot closer then, but still touch base now. Uh, he was competing in powerlifting and he was like the only dude in the gym. It was super like new. Um, powerlifting has grown heaps in the last three, four years in a show. And I would always go watch him compete. I traveled to Melbourne to watch him at nationals. And that was kind of like my buy-in. I was like, this is really cool. And I was interested. And so after that rugby injury, I wasn't keen on jumping straight back into footy. So I looked for something and I may have done a body a, a bodybuilding prep just before this actually from memory i did like a really crappy like uh like i'm sure i can say crappy, but really crappy like six weeks seven week like boom like lost like five kilos i was like i'm on stage Woo. And oh my then, um, so i haven't actually done a bodybuilding prep if you ask me i just went up on stage um <laughs> <laughs> anyway so yeah i jumped into um I, I asked Luke to kind of help me out with a prep for powerlifting and it was incredible. It was so much fun. Um, I progressed so much physically. I progressed so much mentally in that time, which I'll touch on in a sec. And, um, you know, I went from like, uh, I, my numbers at the time was I was high barring 200 kilos, which was like mind blowing to me you know, as, as like a rugby player. No one was doing that. And I did this 12 week prep and I high barred 230 at this competition. And it was at this like bowling club in, um, it was in Newcastle, which is where, powerlifting kind of started in australia there's like all these ogs there who all equipped lift which is where powerlifting started like raw is the new powerlifting equipped is the the og um and there was all these like old fellas and it was like really cool and um i just had a ball i had such a fun time and that was where i really bought in i was like this is what i'm gonna do 
and since then I've, I think I've clocked up 12 comps in, in the last three years. And, um, so yeah, you know, like, like I said, I found, um, my coach, Andrew Tang shortly after that, Luke was more helping me as a buddy. Um, and I found Tang because he was studying physiotherapy at Macquarie Uni, like all these little like stars align moments. And yeah, that was like my transition and it was pretty simple, but it was kind of there the whole time. I always loved to train and at, at the core, yeah, I enjoyed the bodybuilding aspects and yeah, I jumped on a stage and yeah, I was always, there was always a degree of vanity to training, but at the core, it was me wanting to get stronger. It was me wanting to push the logbook, you know, that was more it than, oh wow, my quad has grown this much, you know, it was less mm -hmm. that. Um, so I guess for me, it was something that I found a sport that I always loved, but I didn't know I loved it, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just loved it more and more every time I've competed, every, every client that I've put through a competition, every client that I've, you know, uh, taught from the ground up, like it just, it grows how much I enjoy this process. And I think that it's so reflective of stuff you learn in life and it can translate so well across life, um, which I think most sports can, if you look at them the right way. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the transition. Yeah, cool. So with uh, powerlifting, what aspects do you think that you, you can pull out and use in your everyday life? Well, I think the really important thing about, you know, strength training, looking at even hypertrophy is the biggest thing we learn is it's not nonlinear. We learn that there are ebbs and flows, peaks and troughs. And the reality of that is we have an emotional investment in this process. And we have to understand that there are going to be some days that are going to be awesome. There are going to be some days that are going to be not so awesome. There are going to be some days are going to be catastrophic. And then there are other days that are, you know, your fondest memories. And that's something which teaches you pretty quickly um, how to deal with those and how to put them into perspective rather quickly and how to mature as an athlete and as a byproduct of that mature as a person. And so only if you grasp it in that way, you know, I feel that one person could float through powerlifting and just treat it as that hobby and that sport. That's, that's that. And then for, for someone like me, I certainly draw those connections that I just mentioned. Um, and like, you know, something I'm going to mention later on um, is, you know, I love to journal, love to, to diarize things and write down thoughts. And I've become a much more self-aware person in the last three years. Um, and so, yeah, it is only given to my perspective, my maturity and my understanding of the bigger picture. I think that's one of the biggest things that I learned through powerlifting. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you start your diary with dear diary? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you die if your girlfriend found it? Is it that personal? No, it's super personal, but we're really open with each other about okay. stuff like that. So Would you die if we found it and published it? <laughs> uh, Mm, probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might try to bribe you, Mrs. and see if she'll sell it to me. <laughs> uh, well, if it gets her a good enough price, I'm going to be happy because that comes through me too. <laughs> yeah, it's just true. It's, yeah, a win -win. it's a win win for everyone. You need to start writing got... down some things in there that you want published. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, like... Oh I'm God. just, I'm just I'm that well endowed. I need to start buying bigger underwear. <laughs> something like that. I have to say something like that, actually. I was not sure if you guys would be out. Miss Anne, I have like a 10 inch penis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do that. And then... just, just another girl that couldn't handle me. <laughs> <laughs> you got to have two Man. diaries and make sure we get the right one. Uh, maybe you don't... Oh, that is classic. Maybe don't let her read that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. That's too funny. So yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of powerlifting. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess we want to talk a little bit about the other stuff too, you know, like coming through more um, uh, aesthetic based training, aesthetic based sport, so to speak, and then even team sport. Something that I really wanted to touch on, if you're okay with me kind of taking it this way, yeah. um, is, you know, when I was back in school, went to Kings in, in Sydney and massive sport push in the culture there, which again, really facilitates other areas of life like study. So it kind of works out really well when you're in school. And so the discipline level when I was in school was, was a really big part of that process. And I was playing footy, but the main sport I want to talk about is I was actually rowing. Um, and rowing is a super unique experience and a super unique sport because it develops this grit and this discipline that you don't really find all the time. And it, I think that it's a big part of what makes me the athlete that I am now in powerlifting. However, I also think there are some pitfalls there. Um, and what I want to talk about is this idea of like being really like 
tough and really hardy and like, you know, wanting to like feel the pain and how that can be productive for sure. And there are moments in training for bodybuilding, for powerlifting where that's really necessary. And that's going to make a difference between like number one and number two. And in some cases, how that's super destructive. I have examples of myself. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in, so, so in rowing, you know, some examples often, you know, we'd be on the water 5am three, four times a week before school rowing for two, three hours training. Um, on the weekends, on a Saturday, if we went in racing season, we were there 5, 6 a.m. We started on the water for a three-hour period. We'd hop off and we'd have like a cooked breakfast. We would, you know, rest for half an hour, an hour. We'd go on a 10, 15K run. We'd come back and we'd do lunch. And then we'd go for an afternoon session on the water. That was our Saturday if it wasn't a race day. And so we've got this packed out schedule that pretty much meant that all of the students were training or studying and that was kind of life. Um, so it created this regiment and the schedule, but more particularly, some of the experiences would be, you know, you're on the water for three hours. Um, the biggest thing that you'll find with rowers is they develop these really tough hands because of the, you know, environment you're in on the water, you're getting wet hands. There's a friction of being on the oar and pretty much as you're rowing, you're developing really painful blisters. This is the kind of thing that, you know, your everyday Joe Blow would stop rowing when you start mm -hmm. feeling this kind of pain. And often those blisters or parts of your skin would start ripping off and you start bleeding and you've got salt water in the mix. And long story short, it's just a very painful experience, but something that was always ingrained and drilled in was that that didn't matter that you would keep going and you would keep going for your team. You would keep going because you wanted to, you know, make the highest possible crew. Like if you're mid race, it doesn't matter. And so this concept that pushing through pain was good was really drilled in. And that was positive for that sport. Moving on to something, you know, more like bodybuilding, valid, you know, there are going to be sets where you're building that lactic fatigue, where you're feeling pain, where you're not actually at mechanical failure, but you're in pain and you've got to keep moving and you want to push to a certain RPE to be productive as a bodybuilder. And if you don't have that capacity, perhaps you're losing out. If I fast forward to powerlifting, it's not that helpful to mm. have that skill. Uh, it can be a real detriment at points. Uh, and I have a really prominent example of recent in my recent prep and, you know, sure there are bodybuilding phases as a powerlifter. We know that. So that's, that's one thing. But when you're actually in a powerlifting prep, if you're reaching like lactic fatigue and, and failure from that standpoint, you're probably not programming optimally. In my opinion, a lot of training is submaximal and the focus comes, comes on skill execution technique and the correct stress. Um, so for, for me in my recent prep, I pushed myself really, really, really hard in my pre prep block, which was really big on high bars, really big on front squats, a lot of quad loading, a lot of knee loading. And because I'm ambitious and because I know my markers and my previous best and all the rest of it, when I get RPE handed to me as a guide, that can be really great or it can be to my detriment and really destructive in this case that mindset that I developed in that previous sporting background pretty much led me to get um, to develop a uh, compartment syndrome in my quads mm. and develop some, some tendinopathies in my knee tendons. Um, and unfortunately I carried that all the way through my prep into my competition. The double barrel there was I did also didn't communicate it very well. I just mm. copped it. I was very much in that mindset of, uh, it's okay, you know, growing, push through the pain. It's okay. Yeah. This is good. Um, you know, done. you'll be fine. You're still moving fine. Yada, 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 yada. On, it, on it goes. And it was such an unhealthy mindset for the context that I was in. You know, it's such a funny idea, this seesaw, right? We come to the middle where it's optimal in that context to be like, you know, oh, tough and, and do things this way and that, but you quickly fall off the other side where it becomes too much and it becomes destructive in certain mm -hmm. contexts. And so I would say, you know, a lot of powerlifters and a lot of new lifters who haven't done a lot before powerlifting, they're right down one end of the seesaw where they need to actually climb up and get a bit more of that. But then you've got athletes like myself and a lot of others who I know who actually need to check themselves. They actually need to make sure that they are adhering to the more sensible plan that supports their goals long-term. And in my case, like I said, actually communicating really, really well. So, you know, you guys know Nick um, from Balance Health and Performance. He's taken care of me for a long time. 
I actually remember he gave me a phone call after competition because the post that I made about my squats not going as well as I wanted was literally like one of the first times he'd heard me talk about my knees. Right. right. And this was such a funny thing. And yeah. Right. And it's just funny. Cause like I pride myself on communicating really, really well. You know, this thing, I, I communicate like profusely well when I can, or I try to. And when it comes to catching up with, with Nick and talking to Tang, like I, I would like to think I tell him everything. For some reason, I took this responsibility of this pain I was feeling and I didn't want to, or there was this natural knack to not share it, to not look for help. And it led to what was not the most optimal squat prep for me personally. Um, the great thing is I've reflected upon that. I've got great mentors in Nick and Tang who, like I said, Nick called me <laughs> and we had a very good chat <laughs> uh, about that because, you know, he wants, he, he has my best interests at heart. And long story short, this mindset can be, it can be so productive and I think is so important, but it is also so vital that it is regulated in the particular phase of powerlifting where you are not having to be that mental guy pushing, pushing, pushing limits and necessarily moving through those pain markers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, very interesting. I thought that would be an interesting topic to discuss because I think we've got two camps right now in the fitness industry. And one is probably more so that old school idea, right? Of hard training is good training, pain is good, work hard, work hard, work hard. And then we probably had this other camp if we were to separate into two, which is like the total opposite. It's like flexibility is like number one. Um, you know, if you want to miss training, miss training. If you want to, you know, miss things on your tracking of your food, do so. And I think there's a really nice middle ground mm. where in certain contexts, the old idea to a degree makes a lot of sense. And in a lot of contexts, as we know, flexibility is important for optimizing long-term uh, benefits and long-term progress. And we've got to find this nice middle ground. And so I'm learning that still, you know, like I still see myself as a very young coach, a very young athlete. And I'm always trying to learn off guys like you, Dean, Tang, Nick, you know, I do my best to read up on resources and do courses and just continue to learn what's going to optimize my performance and what's going to optimize the performance of my athletes. Um, and I think the, the centerpiece of that, the more I talk about it is communication, right? Mm -hmm. Like it all comes back to good communication and good understanding. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the biggest takeaways for any athletes out there who are in whatever phase of, of their journey or can relate to mine is um, not all the skills you learn from one sport will apply to another all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One thing I learned at, uh, in debate at uni is that when you have a really robust understanding of any topic, it's very rare that you totally agree with this side and disagree with that. Usually there's some sort of middle ground. So like you're talking yeah. about like having that kind of gritty attitude towards dealing with pain is necessary, but you also need to know when to pull back and when to be flexible. And so you're trying to say that you now have one foot on either side of the fence. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. I think an important take home for listeners is that like what's right for Matt, like the, the balance for you wouldn't be the same balance with someone with different priorities, like average Joe just trying to get a bigger squat for funsies. Like it's not Absolutely. for funsies for you. You're a very competitive athlete. Mm. So yeah, kind of figuring out what balance looks like individually would be important. Totally. Yeah. And, and I think to touch on that too, is that's a very big part of happiness in the sport and just in general, it's, it's actually knowing what you prioritize, right? Cause sometimes we get individuals who will, you know, if, for example, for me, right, if I don't progress in the way I want to, I genuinely, um, maybe, maybe not in public, but like, I feel I have like the right to complain. Like I, I live this, you know what I mean? Like that really triggers me because like I put so much into it. I think that in the case of uh, someone who maybe wants to be more balanced and progresses more in other realms of life and maybe isn't as wholly committed to the sport, it's more of a hobby. You know, there's not necessarily, if you haven't aligned your expectations, there's not necessarily that same, again, it's, it's not that high horse of that right to complain. It's more of your expectations need to be aligned with the level of commitment that you have to anything, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like what you said about that, that, that concept of that Joe Blow who's just coming in and wants to grow his squat. Um, I think it just, it just sits a little bit differently. I don't know if that makes sense, but it just sits a little bit differently in terms of how much you're putting in. This is that classic, how much you're putting in versus how much you're theoretically going to get out. You know? Yeah. 
investment yeah, on return. Yeah. Return on investment. Yeah, I think the, yeah. the other thing here is like having the ability to have an internal conversation about what your expectations and awareness of what you put in is. And then also totally. some external regulators to check you when you make mistakes. Can you give me some examples? Yeah. So I think Matt's the perfect example. He has external regulators like he had me at one stage. He has Nick and he has Tang. Like they're his external regulators of what he's currently doing. And they're looking at it more objectively. They really care about what he's doing from a performance point Massively. of view. Massively. But it's also super important that he takes some time to have some internal conversation around being aware of where he actually is situated. So like mm. I think anyone that's come from a team environment, I'm similar, right? <laughs> they're going to know whether or not they were the person that did everything for the team because the team mattered the most, or if when things got hard, they tried to hide in the corner so that the team would hold them up. That kind of a, 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 an understanding of who you are will then probably transfer then into your individual sport if you choose to do one. So like I was always intrinsically motivated to do well for myself within the team. But if the team was struggling, I was always also there for the team. So I had a higher like, um, respect for the people around me and I wanted to work for them. But I had an even higher drive because I had a higher intrinsic motivation to work for myself. Uh, so then put myself into an individual sport where I'm just training. My ability to take myself to the limit is also quite high. Uh, mm. But out of sheer arrogance and not wanting to step back, my ability to pull back when necessary is also pretty low. Um, yeah. so external regulators are really important. We actually do as really, I say, not as I do. Yeah, we had a really cool podcast <laughs> with Nick, funnily enough. Uh, and he was talking about the fact that, you know, like someone like myself, I need to have a checklist uh, to, to check myself. When mm. I say, like, for example, I have a particular shoulder issue that's ongoing, it's a long term pathology. Like, what are the three things that I need to look for that are going to tell me I'm on my way to bigger problems? Mm. And then check those quickly. And you'd probably need to be similar. I think we actually found one with Tang. So, an interesting thing I think we found with our. Uh, uh, Tang, myself, and Maddie was Maddie's getting to the, sort of the advanced level of his category, his weight category now with powerlifting, and that is that you're getting towards the top end of the weight category. You have to shift under with some food manipulation at the end, so you're like you're, you're nearly maxing that out. Yours is 84, right, Matt? 94. Oh, 94. Not 94. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But like, depending on what stage you're in as a powerlifter, you're going to spend more or less time either trying to focus on growing more tissue because more tissue moves more weight, or you're going to focus on up, upping your skill, repetition of performance. You know. Uh, mm -hmm. And Maddie spent a time where we decided, hey, I think you can afford to spend a bunch of time in hypertrophy phase. Like, let's take some breaks from competition, step away from the typical sort of powerlifting training. Let's go bodybuilder esque. And because of his work capacity and also his intent to make a true RPE of a nine, we figured mm -hmm. out that by four weeks at RPE scale training, Deload. cooked himself. Yeah. Because most people need two, three weeks to find their limit. Then they have two to three weeks to overload. Maddie found his limit in week one. And then week two got difficult. Week three got real difficult. Week four went, oh, I'm just about to shoot the bed. <laughs> but the best thing was that internal conversation, probably with yourself, like, oh, this is a bit, a bit iffy. You had some regulation through myself and through Tang, and then you let yourself go too far and then relied on the data to, to pull you back. And now you have some information to go forward with, which is super cool. Yeah. Big time. And in experiencing that, you know, now we're able to balance how heavily we jump into that kind of training phase. And with, the, with that, I would say that's about as hard as I'd like to push being able to train for four weeks and deload. Um, and we're able to slide that scale and figure out where we want to work, how hard we want to work, what we're trying to achieve. Um, because after working that hard for, you know, what was a long period of time for like the classic powerlifting season is what, what I've figured out is that that hypertrophy phase is carrying me really nicely, not just for like one comp and then go back again but it's actually allowing me not to necessarily go all the way back down that side again right away, um, which has been really nice. So yeah, we're, we're, we're always finding that balance. And I think what you said, having, having those checkers around you is so vital and even in just goal setting. Um, so what I did with Tang at the start of the year is I, I actually write him a weekly email of my thoughts and reviews of the week, which is a little bit abnormal. Mostly that's, that's uh, what comes from him to me. Um, as a coach and client and I write my my reviews of the week and what I did this year was I set some super ambitious goals for the year because I have really consciously and vocally prioritized powerlifting and being an athlete this year and that sounds funny to say because people, oh, don't you always do that well no last year was a massive personal push and massive business push for me um, business grew a lot I moved into this place purchased this place which was massive for me and that was a financial responsibility that meant I had to work really hard too mm. so I put what I could I put all of what was left into being an athlete 
but now I'm in a position where I can give more. And so I've had that really honest discussion with Tang, who's like my most close checker, so to speak. Uh, and I've set these really high goals and he's been able to say to me, yeah, I think that's actually realistic or it's, that's really out of the ballpark, for example. Mm. And that's so helpful for me because how upsetting it can be for someone to set these really ambitious goals and get nowhere near them because nobody told them that was lofty. Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, I have some clients that set some ambitious goals and don't put in the work and get really disappointed. So it's not that the goal itself was unrealistic, although some people for sure set those. Uh, it's that they wanted to reach these ambitious goals without putting in all the work, maybe some of it. Oh, yeah. But that means you only get some of the results. Um, and it's so helpful when those clients come back and reflect on what they did wrong. And, you know, I didn't get there because blah, blah, blah. But some clients also don't like to take any responsibility and like to blame the plan that they never followed in the first place. Mm -hmm. 100%. And, um, <laughs> can, you, can you relate to that with your clients? I can relate with a couple of clients. Not many, yeah. but I've got some experiences in this. Yeah, yeah it's frustrating. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. That's what I was talking about before. It's actually more, it's, it's less about as a coach, more like, oh, you didn't follow the plan. It's more of like, are you happy now? Like yeah. as a client and as an individual, you set these crazy goals. You obviously really wanted to reach them, but didn't action that. Like, is that, are you happy about that? Like, I, don't, I can't mm. see that being a point of happiness for people. Um, and I think that's number one is that if you're setting goals that align with your inputs, like we said before, um, there's a aligned expectation of if I don't get there, why was that the case? You know, mm -hmm. especially when it's more of a, like, let's talk, let's talk losing weight and let's talk like a total on the platform. Like arguably there are a lot more variables which can not go your way on the day on a platform. Like that's mm -hmm. one thing, right? Whereas we'd like to think that we have control of most of the variables and when we track things correctly and we're, we're honest, um, weight loss becomes more simple. More predictable. Um, and if you, yeah, more, 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 much more predictable. And so if you don't get to a certain target, you can probably target clear things that didn't happen. Mm. So it is a little bit different sometimes in powerlifting when it comes to the platform. However, the same concepts, the same framework I think applies is that if you have a really ambitious goal or a slightly less ambitious goal or a really realistic goal, there's going to be behaviors that are going to push you in one of those directions. Mm -hmm. And if you're making this goal, but your behaviors are pushing you this way, you may be setting yourself up for some disappointment and sadness, yeah. which, you know, is obviously not what we're after. So I think that's one of the simplest but most important things for anyone in any goal, but particularly in sport and in weight loss and in body composition is align your shit to what you want to achieve. Mm. You know, like really simply yeah. do it, do the work. If you really want to do it, if you want to call it out, be honest with yourself and make the sacrifices. If that's how you see it, I don't see it that way, but do the stuff that you need to do to get there. Like super mm. simple, but not something that happens that often. Yeah, totally. I find her, I feel a responsibility as a coach when someone does set a really ambitious goal, because uh, we can get anyone to lose, you know, 10 kilos in a week if they want, like go mm -hmm. get your arm. <laughs> like there's always a way. <laughs> yeah. But um, <laughs> I feel a responsibility to outline the things that uh, they will have to give up in order to get there. So it sounds like you're really reflecting on, okay, these ambitious goals means that I can't do as much with my business. Maybe I can't hang out with my girlfriend as much, like whatever, whatever. And you've weighed this up and decided it's worth it. Um, where we have people come to us and say, hey, I want to do X. Uh, and, you know, I'll just eat a bit more veg and I should get there. Oh, no, sweetheart. It's <laughs> actually going to mean that you sacrifice this, this, this and this. And if they say, that's cool, I'm willing to pay those costs, then like, let's go. But I think yeah. we need to make that clear to clients what that goal really means and what that process will cost them. Mm, yeah. I think, I think most people's intentions are good. You know, like someone comes to you, Maddie, I want to do the following. Like the intention is there. Like that's, it's likely not a, a faked intention. No. What a lot of people lack is the foresight or the ability to recognize what they need to manipulate to make the intention become a reality. And yeah. that's, that's that's super important conversation at the start. Like you've had with Tang, like we have with a lot of clients. Like we have clients that will, yeah, put in a questionnaire that say, I'm 100 kilos and 15% body fat. I want to be 100 kilos and 5% body fat. It's like, okay, that's a great <laughs> intention. I would love to be that person also. However, these are the following things. That we're Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Because it's not that, yeah. like, this is kind of coming from, like you said before, too. It's not through like a, a lack of 
um, them wanting to do it. It's just they probably no. don't know. They just need some education. Just to give a really simple yeah. example um, outside of like physique goals, uh, if it's a little mm. bit confusing, I get my eyebrows tattooed on. <gasps> and You never told me. I feel like I've been... <laughs> <laughs> I used to wake up. Great. And <laughs> Thank you. And um, for, those of, for those listeners who don't know what feathering is, essentially it's just like little lines behind the eyebrow. So I went to my cosmetic tattooist and I said, I would like feathering. And she went, okay. You know, she went away and did some feathering. And then I came back and I was like, hey, like none of the color has lasted. She was like, you asked for feathering. Part of feathering means that the color doesn't last as long. If I just did a block color and use the gun, you would have been happier. And to that, I said, hey, I told you what outcome I wanted. You could have told me the costs and benefits of that before we went ahead with it. And, you know, I, I hope that example is clear with when a client says, I want this, mm. and we have the responsibility to say, sure, to get that, these are the costs and benefits. Mm. And then we go forward from there. And I never would Totally have, right. Yeah, yeah. I never would have uh, proceeded with my initial goal if she told me that I was going to need to pay 600 bucks and get them touched up more frequently. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in, in light of that, I think that's a great example. It's a contextual-based process. Um, you know, I can have an athlete come to me who has fantastic squat leverages, um, has been training for five, six years and built a lot of muscle mass, walks in the door, has a 250 squat max and says to me, I want to squat 300. Crazy goal, really lofty, but you can do it. That's, mm. that's really possible for you, you know? And then the next person walks in the door has started training a year ago. Uh, they've got barely any muscle on their frame, really long femurs, so poor leverages for squatting. And they give me the same goal. I'm probably going to sit down and have a really honest discussion with that person and say, it's possible, but here are the, here are the long-term strategies and long-term things that are going to need to occur for you to reach that elite level of strength, mm. you know? And that's me as a coach, uh, like you've said, actually putting a really clear picture in the mind of that person of what it will take to reach that goal. Um, and like you've, like you've touched on, that's a shared responsibility because just like with the eyebrows, if someone comes to a coach and sets that goal of 300, my guy who's, you know, uh, not got much muscle on the frame and isn't built well to squat, and I just kind of shrug my shoulders and go, cool, like, great goal, you know, I'm really setting that person up for a sad time and failure, like a touchdown, you know. So I think I absolutely agree. It's very much that education and that shared, that shared process um, that that client needs to be aware of what sacrifices or what process it's going to take to get to that big goal. You could always just say, how long are your arms and do you like to bench press? <laughs> say, I want to squat 300. You're like, show me your arms. Let's redirect this. Let's redirect this. <laughs> I wish we all had arms like Aaron Sims and just like to deadlift. The only for deadlifting though, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, well, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, exactly. Actually, he's a really good example of understanding the necessity for taking a step back as a power lifter. Now, for those at home that aren't aware, the goal of a power lifter is the biggest total over three meters squat bench depth. Now, some mm -hmm. people are going to be good at squatting, benching, or deading. They might be good at all three. They might be brilliant at one and not great at one, the other, right? But the goal is to get yep. a big total. Aaron has quickly realized that his capacity to increase his deadlift, because his leverages are so good, his skill is so good, and his ability to repeat that process is so good, that focusing time on trying to bench bigger is not worth it to him. So he benches very little from what I've seen. He essentially maintenance benches because he knows, I'm probably going to gain five kilos, six kilos, but on my deadlift, I can gain 20 or 30 kilos. So his deadlift impact on his total is a lot higher. So like he kind of has, has that ability to sort of in retrospect of looking at how he performs and where his skills are at. Let's max out my max skill to give him the max benefit. Yeah. And he has that yeah. conversation with his coaching will. And I think it's a, it's a really cool thing to see. That's the thing. And also, you know, I guess in, in, in light of that and to continue that discussion, like if you have like, 10 inputs that you can that you can give right and in in aaron's case like you said he's an extremely talented extremely well-built deadlifter if he's going to put equal shares you know 3.33 repeat or whatever into each three lift um his return for his bench press let's say in a three-month period might be five kilos if he were to increase those inputs by two units he might still only get five kilos or six Mm. You know, so it's less about reducing his inputs there. It's more that what's the diminished return because most, and you'll see this trend. If someone's really good at deadlifting, like elite, like Aaron is generally, generally that means there's something about the build. And the first thing we look at is the length of arms for him. Right. Mm. Yeah. And also the incredible hip mobility. There are a lot of aspects and then his skill. Right. But 
immediately that arm length takes away from another lift. It mm -hmm. takes away from that capacity to bench press while it's a huge demand on the shoulders to go through that big range of motion and it's more work required mechanically to get back up to the top. And so naturally, if you took the same athlete and you could dock length off his arms, his deadlift would go down, his bench press would go up. Mm -hmm. And so straight away, we've got a way you're built. People talk about genetics and different sports. Well, it's so prominent in powerlifting. Um, and it's such a funny thing. And I often have this discussion and just to go on a little tangent, I often talk about um, what it means to be a good deadlifter or a good bench presser. I'm far more impressed by Steve Hansen's a great example. One of my boys who's really well built for deadlifts, not as severely, so to speak, as Aaron, um, but he also has an, a two times bodyweight bench press. Mm -hmm. He is a very good bench presser, not because he's built well to do it, but because he's actually a good bench presser. Guys like myself, shorter arms, I wouldn't call myself as good of a bench presser as Steve. I'm well built to do it. I should be good. Mm. Right? If I can develop a really technically sound deadlift, that's something which I would classify as a good deadlifter. So I look at it a little bit differently. You know, I don't look at it as that person's number is high on the deadlift, like Aaron. Like he's a fantastic deadlifter. That's not something I would dispute at all. But for someone with less favorable leverages to do what he's doing would be more impressive to me. So I look at that lift that you're not as well built for but coming full circle back around to the idea of him pulling away some, some inputs to the bench press, super smart. Because like you said, it comes down to the total, his bench press, so long as he's continuing that you know, relatively good progression, it's probably a little bit silly for him to increase the inputs rapidly for really minimal return, you know, on something he's not that well built for. The question that I ask is, where is the theoretical ceiling for him at this body weight for the deadlift? One thing he has struggled a lot with at times has been balance uh, and has been holding on to the deadlift with his hook grip. Um, and that's something which you know, he's pulling well into the 300s uh, as a, I'm not sure how heavy he is, around 80? 70, 70 something. I think if he eats a lot of food, he's like 77 kilos. Yeah, not a big guy. And I which, think he's topped out which at is phenomenal. Crazy. Yeah, which is, which is phenomenal. And so then the question begins to get asked at different points in time, will there come a time where he wants to solidify his ability to pull 350s consistently and does redirect inputs mm. into bench press and squat and whatever it is. But as long as there's a thought process there and you know, Will's a fantastic coach and I'm sure they have a great plan, as long as there's a thought process there and like we've spoken about, expectations are aligned, like happy days, you know, yeah. it all works out. And Aaron Sims has the cutest dog ever called Bear. So shout yeah. out to Bear. If yeah. And he's a shout out to Bear. And Aaron, I think, might even be more of a coffee snob than me. Really? He's, a very, he's, he's also, just to talk him up some more, he's a very talented uh, musician. guitarist. Yeah. Well, did you see the Flex Success Christmas song where all the coaches got around and uh, sung a Christmas song? I didn't see that. Actually. Oh, I have to send it to you. So I changed Please the lyric do. to, what was it? It was Rudolph the Red Nosed yeah. Reindeer. So it was sort of like... Um, it start anyways, it doesn't matter. It's it's very funny. And um I, I sent it to Aaron. Oh, I have an excellent singing voice. Are you ready? <laughs> uh, we no. sped it up and sounded like chipmunks, so let's leave it at Hectic. <laughs> we only sped it up because we needed to make it under a minute to post to Instagram. Mm. Otherwise, I'm totally fine with my Marge Simpson after a big night out voice being on social media. <laughs> but I, I sent the lyrics to Aaron and because he's a musician, I was like, Hey, can you help me out? And I think we're going to commission him next year to yep. be the guitarist behind the next Flex Success Christmas song. <laughs> Love that. <Yeah. laughs> so now, you, now you're definitely locked in, Aaron. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, bro. Love you there. <laughs> um, I think we're coming up on time here, mate. So any final words for anyone that's considering powerlifting or anything you just want to talk about the topic? Well, I'd actually love you to touch on how people can be less shit because that is mm. the tagline of our podcast, how to be less shit. How to be less shit. Well, I think as we've talked about guys, when it comes to powerlifting or anything in life, it's really, really important in my opinion to have a super clear picture of where you're headed. A uh, really clear picture, a really clear picture, <laughs> really clear picture of what it's going to take to get there and the right people around you, whatever that means. Um, you know, I think I've really touched on the importance of mental aspects, um, whether that be grit, determination, ability to push through pain, but also knowing when, what is important when it comes to training for powerlifting. Um, there are some times where it's more important to be intelligent and more thought out and other times where it's more important to be less directed in that, in, in that area and more directed in that tough mindset, you know, where it's going to be really, really important to push through pain. So being as self-aware as possible and being more educated and learning from your experiences all come under that umbrella. 
Um, one thing that I wanted to touch on a little sort of tip, so to speak, was the concept I talked about before of, of journaling. I think it's something for me personally that has been really useful in improving my day-to-day self-awareness and my direction. And it's not something that works for everyone. There's going to be something different that kind of ticks your box. But for me, I've actually got it right here. This is my, it's my journal. I literally write in this every single day for my training. A lot of the time it's my program. I, I copy my program from my email from Tang and I write it in physically. I like to write it in physically because I, I develop this connection with what I'm going to be doing. I start thinking about it and I've already started living out that process. And that's really, really important for me. But the second thing that it, it gives me the opportunity to do is I start thinking about other things that could be on my mind or other things that might be taking up space. And so some of the pages in between my programs are just actual diary entries, um, little entries that a, <laughs> a little, yeah, a bit of that, a little, a little bit of, it's an opportunity for me to deload the mind. And I think it's something that, you know, in a world where we're always moving really, really fast, a lot of technology, it's such a breath of fresh air for me to actually dive into my journal. And what I said, a lot of my guys on my team is if it's negative thoughts, it gives me the capacity to put it in the book, close the book and put the book away. Um, and this is what I'm talking about when it comes to being more self-aware. So outside of all the actual more nitty gritty lifting stuff we've been talking about, this is like a more life thing that I would touch on as something that's been so useful for me and for my powerlifters, but also non powerlifters as well. Um, and it comes down to having direction, having a clear pathway, having aligned expectations, having the right people, and then, you know, trying to be as self-aware as possible through that process. So you can be happy. <laughs> mm. That's the biggest thing, right? Is the biggest takeaway on my focus this year. And, uh, you know, not so much as a resolution, so to speak, but a realization that I had after the year last year that I had, is that I'm a pretty happy person, generally speaking, but focusing on happiness as your outcome gets you a lot of places and actually gets you a lot of success in the sport you choose to do or the work you choose to do. If the end result is like success and reaching the goals, like that's going to mean happiness. And I think that's one of my biggest focuses and probably my biggest piece of advice is seeking that and you're probably going to tick boxes along the way. Okay. Mm. Thanks for your perspective, Matt. No worries at all. <laughs> um, now, moving on to our funny questions. Not quite. Well, first, we've got the one. Oh, yeah. Something I worth always sharing. forget this one. Something worth sharing. We always ask our guests, Maddie, if they've uh, read, watched, looked at anything that they think is worth sharing, that maybe of value or even just enjoyment to those that are listening. Do you have anything in the recent times that you would opt in? Um, the Art of Not Giving a Fuck was a great book, um, which I read. Um, and there's another one by this. Sorry? Did it help you give less fucks? Um, well, yes and no. It was one of those things which, again, gave a lot of perspective and it just went through a little bit of an analysis of, you know, commonalities or common feelings and thoughts which we, which we sort of align with things that happen in our life. Um, and it was just a different side of the coin is as far as I'll go with it. I think that people who want to read it will want to dive in and, and you form your own perspective on these sort of books. But also um, my coach Tang gave me another one by the same author. I've Everything forgotten the name, fucked. but I'm... A, yeah, I'm about to yeah, dive into that it. one. Yeah, it's yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's awesome. Real good. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I used to be a massive reader. I more read like resources for coaching these days, um, but I'm really keen to get back into some books like that one. So yeah, that's about as far as I'd go. I think my like like what I said before, um, you know, something to share would, would be almost more that journaling thing that I was talking about would more be what I would direct that at. But yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, if you're, once you get through everything is fucked, if you want more book recommendations outside of coaching, I have a learn to you. So reach out and I'll send you some. Awesome. Will yeah. do. Thank you. Uh, all right. Final round. So these are three quick answered rounds. We've got two predetermined ones and then we've got a fun one at the end. Oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. From a game known, named Shitty Choices. But anyway, we'll get to right. that last. We'll save it for the, for the grand. <laughs> First question, Maddie, is, is it's a bit morbid, but it can be fun. If you had to die tomorrow and you knew you were going to die, how would you die and why? How would I die and why? Oh, well, I guess I could go like super bro -y on this and be like attempting a 300 kilo squat or something or like a 350. <laughs> and then like, and I, and I get it, I get it. And then it like snaps my spinal cord and I die. You know what I mean? Like so that could be trust a power successful. Lift. Do you I get got to that see shit. the white lights first or are you just not sure? Just all white lights. Well, you only really see the white lights when you rack it. So I, I don't even see the white lights. So right. it's not even me. It's more just that like I go down in the history books. 
I go down the history books and um, people never forget my name. So if, <laughs> if seeing the white light while you're dying is a real thing, even if you fail that lift, you think you succeeded. <laughs> right it's the white it's the white light it's the almighty white light yeah <laughs> so what number is worth dying for on a squat <laughs> i don't actually think there is a number worth dying for but you said i had to die yeah, yeah so <laughs> that right. would be the way <laughs> all right you got me in a technical. i don't know why I don't know, I don't know why the only other picture that came to mind was like shark attack i don't know why oh really that came to mind because i don't that want that at all that would not be the way that I'd no. want to go, but that was the only other thing that came to mind. I was like, no, go powerless. Maybe because it's the most frightening thing on earth. I would hate that. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Potentially be dying from both drowning, blood loss, sheer fear. Uh, all yeah. sorts of That's a terrible way. The I just, worst. I just thought of mine. I want like a million puppies to just be so cute that I die of happiness. <laughs> that's how I want to die. Yeah, that's awesome. That's the best uh... All Enjoy right. your bar mat while I've got puppies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you're just you're just there, dead in a room of puppies. It's weird. Like, yeah, I don't know about that. Like, <laughs> it's weird, but it's happy. The puppies. Yeah, it's happy. It's true. Owning you. All right, I'll do. We second both. We, and Liz will do the last. We both be happy. We both be very happy. <laughs> in our own, on your own right. <laughs> the second question is, Maddie. What is something that people don't know about you? Something that people don't know about me. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, Maybe that I'm actually a guitarist as well. I play huh. guitar. I've played for 10 years. Um, what type of guitar? On, on and off now. Well, I've got a semi-acoustic. Um, it's actually sitting just over there. Um, but something probably more interesting that people don't know about me is I went through a phase when I was younger uh, where I had this like heavy metal, like, like really sharp, like silver guitar um, and, you know, cool. played a lot of aligned music to that style. So and now, yeah, a lot more chilled. I, I was thinking you meant a gay phase when you said I went through a phase and there was a short pause. And I was like, oh, okay. That's... <laughs> different phase, different phase. Just as interesting. Hold it up. All right. Sorry. That is cool. For someone who's like, yeah, quite clean cut, wouldn't have picked the, uh, the craziness. No. All right. All right. So this is... Don't worry. When I was, when I was younger, I had different hair. <laughs> ah. So just so you're aware, Maddie, this game is actually a game of would you rathers. Okay. Okay. Would cool. Would you rather be in a bad relationship for the rest of your life or be forever alone with no partner for the rest of your life. Easy. The latter, I would think. Yeah, totally. I'm going for that too. Yeah. Yeah, because I think I think the, the what I touch on there is like, firstly, I'm in an amazing relationship. Love you, Steph. Um, <laughs> but the second thing there is that I, I, I think that what's so important for a healthy relationship is that you're really happy on your own too, you know, like mm -hmm. in your own time and, you know, in your personal life and, and whatnot. I think, yeah, what, what, a, what a hard life being in a really crappy relationship. Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. don't want that. Yeah. No, thanks. We need to break up, Dean. Sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the explosion? <laughs> <laughs> no, Dean and I have had this discussion before as well. We were both single for a long time before we got together. And um, yeah. I just think it makes for an easy relationship, doesn't it? When two people aren't relying on the other for their own happiness. Mm. It's so important. It's actually so vital, I think. Um, for a long lasting happy relationship is that yeah, there's, there's love and there's connection and there's valued time together, but there's also that time apart where you've got your own stuff going on. There's a lot of happiness by yourself. There's hobbies, there's interests, there's friends. Totally. Like that's, 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 that's the, the key for sure. This was kind of one of the reasons why when we got married, I didn't change my last name because people say like, you're becoming one. Like, I don't think that I think we're two different people with different friends and different lives. And we just choose to be in a relationship. But that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm necessarily in the killer. So true. Totally. Yeah. I actually, I actually love that. And I agree. You haven't like morphed into like this one, like demi person. Like... I could trust without you, Dan. I don't want to, but I could. The demi person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. that note, Maddie, where can people find you if they want to seek your, uh, professional skill set <laughs> well mainly um if they want to, if they want to poke me um well <laughs> well um online it's pretty much instagram at the moment i've done a little bit of youtubing but i'm not active there um at the moment so instagram is just it's underscore matt bartholomew don't ask me why the underscore is there um and then yeah if you're if you guys are in sydney i work at paragon strength and performance so if anyone wants to come down and have a chat or say hello or is interested in pursuing powerlifting we'd love to see you and that's where i work it's in our time so they're the two places love it all right arrivederci everyone and mm -hmm. thanks for your time today Matt. amazing thank you for having me on and we'll see you guys soon bye legend thanks mate ciao